responsible for some of the most iconic video games of all time. They invented the first-person shooter, pioneered 3D environments, and created online deathmatch. Without id Software, games wouldn't be what they are today. Their influence can be felt in practically every online shooter ever made. But despite an illustrious history, the new millennium has proved a difficult period for Karmic and Co. With their first new IP in over a decade, Rage, coming to PC and consoles this week, we thought it about time we looked at the illustrious past of one of gaming's most influential developers, id Software. And yes, it is id, not id. Research, yo! So considering id are responsible for some of the most hardcore, goriest, controversial first-person shooters of all time, you may be surprised to find out their first game looked like this. Commander Keen was a 2D platforming game developed for the PC. In the early 90s, the console kids were loving this sort of stuff, and Keen was one of the more successful attempts to bring this style of game to DOS. Between 1990 and 91, six chapters of Commander Keen were released across three packs. The initial chapter of the first two packs were released as shareware, meaning that they were free to share and play in an attempt to tempt people to buy further chapters. Regardless of how well the game sold, this was an incredibly successful way of spreading buzz about the series. Everybody had a copy of Shareware Keen. This was a tactic id would adopt again and again in years to come. It was a pretty cool game, there was loads of interesting bad guys, fun environments to explore and a wonderfully fluid animation and scrolling system developed by the then unknown programmer John Carmack. The game had a nice bright colour palette, pogo sticks and a playable version of Pong on your wristwatch. You didn't even kill your enemies, they just got a bit dizzy and the kid even wore a crash helmet. I mean honestly, it's probably the least controversial game ever made, right on the opposite end of the spectrum to say, I don't know, a chain gun wielding Hitler and stealing Nazi gold? <laughs> In 1992, the face of video games changed forever. Wolfenstein 3D was the first first-person shooter and among the most immersive and violent video games ever released. That's the one. Well, at the time. Technically, there were games as far back as the 70s that were played from a first-person perspective, but these were usually tank or shuttle simulators. Wolf 3D laid the foundations of the FPS, most of which are still pillars of the genre today. You can use a collection of weapons, explore environments, kill bad guys, find keys, open doors, eat plates of chicken, and shoot dogs in the face. Shooting dogs in the face? Talk about wish fulfillment. Uh, uh, yeah, mm, uh, yeah, mm, take that, you son of a bitch. Its realistic gore and ultraviolence were really popular with gamers. It caused a bit of a stir in the media and was banned in Germany, what with all those swastikas. In fairness, even the levels were made of swastikas. But nothing compared to what id had next in the pipeline. Less than 18 months later, id released Doom, which once again took PC gaming by storm. Unlike Wolfenstein, which gave the appearance of 3D, but was actually using a very clever ray casting technique, in Doom the levels were self-contained three-dimensional spaces that you were free to move around in and explore. It was nothing short of a revolution. Suddenly the world you were in became as much of an enemy as the monsters wandering its corridors. This opened a Pandora's box of design possibilities. Levels could have varying heights, have dangerous falls, lava pits, tight dark corridors and wide outdoor arenas. And then there was all the innovations in character design, weapon design and audio. It was also the first game that allowed mods to be installed. And probably most important of all, Doom was the first ever game to have networked multiplayer as we know it today. Everybody had Doom, or at least the first chapter, which, like Commander Keen, was released as shareware. Once boring old media types caught sight of it, they were outraged by its gore, violence and demonic symbolism. They went out and told the world that millions of kids were being corrupted and couldn't stop playing it. What they failed to realise is that the reason everybody was hooked on playing Doom was because it was bloody amazing! Up until that point I was stuck playing games like the Great Gianna Sisters and Jack Nicholas Golf. And then Doom came along and let me chainsaw necklace freaks to bits while listening to 8-bit death metal. Suddenly being a PC gamer wasn't all about solitaire and minesweeper. Suddenly being a PC gamer was badass! The sequel released in 1994 had no major technical, graphical or mechanical changes, but it did add land support, co-op, a bunch of new enemy types and the super shotgun. The story continued immediately after the events of the first game where, you guessed it, a bunch of hell was running amok on Earth. In 96, id stepped away from Doom to concentrate on a brand new IP. Built on id Tech 2, Quake was awesome. For the first time in an FPS, you had full control over where you could look. And check this out, you could bloody well jump! 
It also had 3D character models for the first time and a gloriously foreboding art style. The stellar soundtrack was provided by Nine Inch Nails' Trent Reznor, who would later go on to win an Oscar for his work on the Social Network soundtrack. It was a huge online hit, one of the first games to be recognised as an online sport. It had deathmatch, team deathmatch, duels, single player co-op and mod support. In late 97, the sequel came out with a much more military-focused campaign, further improvements to sound, graphics and atmosphere, large, more open levels and probably the best grenades ever seen in a video game. But multiplayer is where Quake 2 thrived. It became a massive online hit, so much so that when the time came to make another Quake, it decided to take one of the most ballsy design decisions of all time. Quake 3 Arena was an arena deathmatch game released just before the turn of the century. Now that may not sound like a big idea nowadays, but back in 1999 the net was held together by string, practically nobody had broadband, and every time you connected the modem screamed out in agony. <coughs> Downloading a single MP3 took like 27 minutes, and you could just forget about watching movies. Back then we had to download them as animated GIFs and read the script to ourselves. The first rule of Fight Club is you do not talk about Fight Club. The second rule of Fight Club is you do not talk about Fight Club! And if that wasn't enough, the game required an OpenGL graphics card to even run. Cue thousands of gamers saving up their cash and asking each other how to install the bloody things. But it was all worth it. Quake 3 was a masterpiece full of carefully balanced maps, fine-tuned weapons, power-ups and several game modes. It even had some pretty decent bots, so dial-up gamers could enjoy all of these features without having to pay per minute for a ping of 7,000. It all comes together like a carpet bombing of the senses. The colours, the sounds, the explosions, the flying through space and railgunning dudes on the other side of the map. You have taken the, lead. the picking up quad damage and running through the meaty blood clouds of your opponents. I adore Quake 3. It reminds me of a time where skill wasn't capped by the speed of your controller, when a millisecond mouse flick and click was what made you better than the other guy, when your character didn't level up, but your reflexes, coordination and weapon management did. Taking nothing away from modern multiplayer games, I like a good game of Modern Warfare, Battlefield or Gears as much as the next guy, but Quake 3 was pure instinct, the stuff that gave life to the hairs on the back of your neck. Busy working on the latest project, it allowed Grey Matter to develop 2001's pretty average return to Castle Wolfenstein and handed over 2004's not-so-superb Quake 4 to Raven Software. Then in 2005, it resurrected an old friend. Doom 3 brought the series back to Mars with a brand new engine and a far more feature-rich campaign than any of their previous titles. The game was a terrifying corridor crawler with fantastic lighting effects and several returning enemies from the previous games. The only way some gamers could actually cope with the horror of it all was to modify the gun-mounted flashlight to look like a Hello Kitty logo. Ah, uh, that's better. Ah! In recent years, it have collaborated with third-party developers on a remake of Wolfenstein and squad-based shooter Enemy Territory Quake Wars. In-house projects have included Quake Live, the addictive free-to-play browser version of Quake 3, a more traditional port of the game to Xbox Live Arcade, and the iPhone hit Wolfenstein RPG. Then development focused on Rage, their post-apocalyptic shooter-slash-car combat game. I've only played a few hours, but it feels like everything you'd expect from an id game. Stunning visuals, challenging enemies, an arsenal of awesome weaponry, and a story you basically stop caring about within minutes of starting the game. The vehicle combat works surprisingly well, and the atmosphere felt while walking through the game's cities is superb. The problem for it is that they were masters of a genre that others have milked dry. Each id game brought something new to the FPS table, where once we had innovation, we now have duplication. They were the key holders of the PC first-person shooter, but the transition to consoles was a difficult ride for them, paved with missteps and lessons learned. In Rage, perhaps they've finally found their feet. Whether or not it's innovative or exciting enough to join the ranks of its siblings is, well, up to you. So let us know what you think. What was your favourite id software game, and what do you think of Rage? Thoughts as ever in the comment box below.